I was flying to Alaska one time and I had a TSA agent actually take my fly rods out of the carry-on rod tube that I use. It fits perfectly in the overhead bins. Nobody's ever given me grief when I've been flying with it. But this TSA agent takes my rods out and starts visually inspecting each rod section. He said that they looked suspicious. Well, I fly with my fly rods a ton, and I never had anything like this happen to me before. So I told him, and I probably shouldn't have, but I looked at him and I said, hey, what's suspicious is your behavior with my really expensive fly rods. Can I please have them back? Well, this agent gets all huffy and he calls some superior over to look at the rods with him. And I'm standing there. I don't even have my belt back yet. I got no shoes on. I'm holding my pants up with one hand. I'm completely at their mercy. They made me wait an extra 10 daggum minutes before finally giving me my fly rods back. I hope this never happens to you. And on today's show, I'm going to share a few tips on how to avoid headaches like this when you're flying with your fly fishing gear. This is Untangled Fly Fishing for Everyone, presented by Ventures Fly Company. Hey folks, welcome to it. This is Untangled. I'm your host, Spencer Durant. Happy to be here behind the microphone as always. It's been another wonderful week of fishing here in Wyoming. Hope it's been great wherever y'all are at. And we've got a wonderful, wonderful little show put together for you tonight. We're talking everything about changing your fly line, how to know when you need to do that, how to tie a dry dropper rig up wet flies, picking the right fly rod, flying with your flies and fly fishing gear, and tippet rings. So we've got a lot coming down the pike for you. You're going to want to make sure that you're settled in nice and calm. You got that Diet Coke within easy reaching distance so that you can take all this in uh, as we go through it. And thanks to all the folks who listen to the show on the regular, but to the new people who maybe haven't heard Untangled before, if this is your, your first time. Well, this is a show where I take questions from listeners. I answer them here about fly fishing, do my best to help everybody else have a good time out on the water and just enjoy uh, enjoy your fly fishing experience and enjoy the learning part of it too. And speaking of questions, we need a bunch more of them. So please do not hesitate to submit your questions. Any question, no matter how big or how small, will get answered on this show. There's always a link in the podcast description. There is a little bit of a backlog at the moment. Uh, I promise I am working through those, and we'll be getting to them as quickly as we can. It's definitely a good problem to have. But if you've submitted a question maybe a a few minutes or a few few minutes ago, maybe a month or two ago, and you haven't heard it answered yet, be patient. I'm working my way through those, all right? And with that, we are going to jump right into the short question segment of the show, Uh. We, I, I tried to switch things up. I put story time at the end of the show. And if y'all don't like that, if y'all prefer story time at the beginning, let me know. I'm just trying to find a format that really works for everybody, something that we all like, something that just, just flows really well for us. So if you have a strong feeling about where the story time segment goes, let me know. Otherwise, we're just going to jump right into the short questions for the show today. And again, for those new listeners who might be here, we answer a couple of short questions every show. These are questions that don't necessitate it as in-depth of an answer, uh, but are still worth answering because they're questions all of us have or have had at some point in our fly fishing journeys. So with that out of the way, let's jump right into it. Ryan from Utah writes in and says, how do I know when it is time to change my fly line and what line should I choose? Well, Ryan, it's a good question. If your fly line starts cracking or it really won't float at all anymore because of those cracks, then it's time to retire that fly line. You can certainly prolong the life of your fly line by cleaning it, which is something that I do not do as much as I should. In fact, I just noticed this. I was out fishing the other night and fished a big hopper dropper rig and the first three or four feet of my fly line is just sinking almost like it's a sinking line and it's a floating line. So that was an issue. And I kept thinking to myself, man, I got to clean this line. So if your line is sinking and it's not cracked, it's probably because it's not cleaned. Now I believe I'm not hundred percent certain on this because it's been a minute since I bought new fly line, 
But I think every line company, like Rio, Scientific Anglers, uh, Orvis, Airflow, Cortland, I think they all send line cleaner with their lines when you buy a new one from them. So they have it and you can, you can buy line cleaner specifically from the manufacturers as well. Uh, they've got it and it, it's real simple. Clean your lines maybe every five, 10 trips. It, it doesn't take too long. Uh, it's a pretty simple process and that'll help them stay floating as long as possible. Uh, and again, if it's starting to crack though, that's when you need to change your fly line. Uh, as far as the line that you should choose, I am a pretty big fan of the Infinity Taper from Scientific Anglers. Uh, I don't think you can go wrong with that for, for general trout fishing. It's just a wonderful little taper and it works well on, uh, I've got some sage rods, I've got some Winstons. It works well on kind of that whole gamut of fly rod actions. So that's what I would recommend. Thanks for the question, Ryan. I appreciate it. And our next short question comes to us. Alan from Pennsylvania writes in, says, how do you tie your dropper rig to your dry fly? And how often do you change your fly line and your leader? Well, Alan, I appreciate the two for a question, <laughs> by the way. Thanks for sneaking that one on in there. Uh, this is another really good question. So to set up a dry dropper rig, you are going to take your dry fly and the hook's coming out. If you're watching the video podcast, I'm I'm making motions with my hands. It's very, very helpful. <laughs> oh, shoot. You've got your hook, the straight part's called the shank, and then there's the bend of the hook. I always tie my droppers off the bend of that hook. You just take a chunk of tippet, about 18 inches on average, and you just tie it off to the bend of that hook with a clinch knot. It's really simple. And then you just tie your nymph on to the end of that piece of tippet that you just tied onto your dry fly. So that's how you set up your dry dropper rig. Uh, Like I said, I tend to go with about an 18-inch length of tippet because any shorter than that, it tends to tangle a lot and it, it, it's not quite deep enough to get down to where the fish are uh, when you factor in the current speed as well. That's something a lot of folks uh, fail to remember is you need to allow some extra length to let that line or let that fly get down in the current. So uh, unless you're fishing something that's really shallow, that 18 inches is a pretty standard depth. Uh, And then your question about leaders, when you should change them. Well, you should change your leader when it gets tattered with too many abrasions. If you're running it through your fingers and you can feel the the edges that are worn or rough, or if you've cut off a ton at the end of it and you're stuck with a really thick section that you're trying to connect to like 5X tippet, uh, yeah, you need a new leader (laughs) at that point. Uh, you also, if you have a bunch of knots in it, just because you've been tying on new sections of tippet, uh, every knot is another opportunity for that leader to break. And if you're anything like me, sometimes you're in a hurry and you don't tie the best knots and then you hook into a really nice fish and you lose it right at the knot because you couldn't be bothered to take 15 more daggum seconds and just tie a good knot. (sighs) I'm not bitter about it. I promise. Uh, (laughs) no, that happens to me more than I would care to admit. Anyways, at that point, just get a new leader. Uh, We actually sell leaders at a pretty solid price over at VFC. So I've linked all our leaders in the podcast description so you can go pick some up for yourself if you need any new ones. All right. I think that does it for our short questions. We are going to jump into the main part of this week's show. First question for this week's show comes to us from the Great White North. Uh, Giovanni from Ontario writes in and says, I currently have a TFO NXT Lefty Cray 8.9, so it's an 8-weight, 9-weight rod, and reel I got from Bass Pro back in 2016. I wanted to get into fly fishing back then, but I didn't do my research. Long story short, life happens, just never really had a chance to get into it but I'm making the time now and come to the realization that I think the rod might be overkill. I'm not sure if I should sell the rod and reel and try to get something smaller or just use it. Sorry for the long-winded question. I'm just not sure what to do and would love your advice or guidance. Love the show. I've been binge listening to it, trying to get caught up and watching the Ventures Flyco YouTube videos when I can. 
the old lady isn't really a fan of fly fishing. <laughs> Giovanni, I love it. Thanks a bunch for that question. Uh, and you made the best decision of your entire life to get back into fly fishing. There is no doubt that this is the best thing you're ever going to do. Forget the inheritance that you might leave your kids. Don't even worry about stock options or your 401k or getting a chunk of land. Fly fishing, that is the legacy you are going to leave long after you're gone. <laughs> oh, this wasn't a long-winded question uh, at all. It was a really good one. I actually see this situation play out a lot with new anglers. So to directly answer it, no Unless you plan on fishing exclusively for salmon, steelhead, or some saltwater fish, that eight, nine weight is just a bit too much rod. That's, it's just too much. You're not going to really be able to do your dry flies or your nymphs with that. The best rod for a beginning trout angler is the nine foot five weight. And for folks who plan to focus just on bass instead, uh, I'd recommend a nine foot six weight. If you are chasing panfish, then definitely stick with that nine foot five weight. Uh, the reason I say the five instead of the four is when the wind comes up on those lakes when you're out there chasing the panfish, it's nice to have the extra backbone of that five. Now, I recommend the five weight, the nine foot five weight in particular, because it is the perfect balance of power and precision. So you really can fish a good majority of flies. I'd say, no. Maybe almost almost ninety percent of flies. I think you can fish with that nine foot five weight because it's going to handle smaller streamers, even bigger streamers. Uh, it's going to handle nymph rigs just fine. Small and large dry flies. It really is the do it all tool that does a ton of things exceptionally well. And you really only venture off into the higher and lower weights and different lengths when you're starting to specialize. Uh, with a very certain form of fly fishing. So for the beginning trout angler, that nine foot five weight is where I would recommend you go. We actually do sell our nine foot five weight fly flinger and reel combo, which I'll go ahead and link in the podcast description if you're interested at all in checking that out. Uh, but thank you very much, Giovanni. It was a great question. And uh, we'll just keep cruising on in this show here. Our next question is the one that is in the title of the show. This is a game-changing emerger pattern. This is the fly that we all need in our box that I reckon most of us don't have already in there. And this question comes to us, Tommy, from North Carolina. Love your questions, Tommy, by the way. Thanks for sending them in, and keep sending them in for me, please. Anyways, Tommy writes in and says, you guys have talked about a lot of flies, and maybe it's just my ignorance about flies slash entomology, but I have never heard you speak about wet flies, what they are, or when and how to use them. So please pontificate, if you will. Well, Tommy, it, it's dangerous to ask me to pontificate, all right? You might see me running into some kind of rants or something that's going to get me in trouble. It might go viral, but I don't know if it's worth going viral if I say something dumb. Uh, <laughs> No, I appreciate the use of the word pontificate, too. That, that was great. And you're not ignorant either, Tommy. Uh, I don't think we've really mentioned wet flies on the show yet. Maybe in passing, but I know that I haven't gone into detail on them. So I actually really love this question. It's going to be a fun, fun deep dive. So before we get any further, I need to give everybody full disclosure. I do not fish wet flies as often as I probably should. So I have less personal experience to talk about or to talk from with this situation. That all being said, I have fished them before. I'm comfortable fishing them. Uh, I, I'm really not sure why I don't use them more often. I, I think I, I know I tend to get stuck in my ways and I don't like to change too much. Uh, and it might even be a regional thing. I just I didn't know anybody growing up who fished them. My dad didn't, my grandpa didn't, they fished dry flies. And if, if it wasn't caught on a dry fly, it just wasn't a fish according to them. So that's how I was raised. So a lot of the, like the nymphing and the streamers, I had to teach myself that, uh, after I got the hang of fishing dry flies, 
So, I, yeah, I, I don't know why I haven't really done them too much. They are wonderful little bugs. Anyways, I'm getting carried off here. Let's set the stage. A wet fly is also called a soft hackle because they use a soft hackle that's wrapped around the head of the fly instead of a stiff hackle like we use for dry flies. This hackle is very, very similar in appearance to the hackle that we use to wrap woolly buggers. The soft hackle is wrapped around the head only, so not the whole body, and it's wrapped pretty sparsely. It's wrapped on there to add some movement to the fly and make it appear like a bug in the emerging stages of hatching. So it's gone from being a pupa or a larva, depending on what kind of bug it is, down to the bottom. And it's it's rising up, it's emerging up in the water column to hatch up on the surface and anywhere from the from the bottom of the river where in the, they're in the larval stage and they rise up through the water column to the surface, they can be emerging through that whole length. So emergers aren't only ever found in the surface film. They're very commonly found there and trout love to snack on them there, but you will find them at other depths, which we'll, we'll get into that in a second. Um, there's also a category of traditional wet flies that were originally used for Atlantic salmon fishing. They're more like streamers. And I think from Tommy's question that he's probably asking about soft hackles. So we're going to cover soft hackles in this question. Um, I actually have look for it here. Uh, I've actually got this wet fly. Hopefully see, I think if I hold it right there, it's going to actually be in focus. Uh, this is a Balmoral Highlander. It's a traditionally dressed wet fly like this or a salmon fly. They're actually really cool flies. I love them. My grandpa could tie beautiful ones. He used to tie commercially. And I've, I've got a few of his. This isn't one of his. I just happen to have this one sitting uh, behind me in the bookcase. So how fortuitous, right? So let's get back into it here. Soft tackles. In the most general sense, these flies are meant to imitate emerging insects. Emergers hatch, and then they get stuck in the surface film, like I was talking about a second ago. And trout love to eat the bugs that are stuck in the surface film because those bugs can't get away as easily as a dun or the adult version of that fly when they're sitting on the water surface. They can flutter away. If they're trapped in the surface film, they're a much easier target, and the trout key in on that. Often during a dry fly hatch, you will see fish doing what looks like eating off the top, but they're actually feeding just below the surface, snacking on those emergers, just going to town. The giveaway for an emerger eat is when you see a rise, but you don't see the trout's nose break the surface. All you see is the trout's dorsal fin and tail fin breaking the surface. It's more of a porpoising move. It's like they just kind of levitate up and then go back down. And it's less of the traditional uh, rise form that we're used to seeing. So again, if you're not watching the video podcast on YouTube, you're missing out with my wonderfully uh, educational hand gestures that I got going on here. <laughs> oh, so unlike other merger patterns, this is what makes soft tackles a little bit different. They are usually meant to be fished with movement. And this is done for a couple of reasons. Uh, I think the biggest one, in my opinion, is probably to elicit a predatory strike from trout. I actually, I think it was last summer, I was with a, a really, really talented guide, probably the, the most talented guide I've ever met. And he told me once that trout really love food that's moving away from them. That, that, that moving away from them just triggers something in a trout that makes them want to go after it. And that explains why they will hit soft hackles so well when there's a hatch about to start or there's a lot of underwater bug activity. They see that that soft hackle kind of zipping away from them and they just pounce. They are ready for it. Now that we've covered what soft hackles are, I, I think we're all pretty square on what they are. Let's talk about how we fish these bugs, all right? There are two main ways to fish them. You can do it on the swing or in an infrared, and we'll look at both of these. If you're going to fish it on the swing, and I think this is what trips some people up, they see that soft tackles are often fished this way, 
and they think, oh, that's a whole new skill set. I don't know if I can learn that. It's actually really similar to how you fish streamers, and it's it's not very technically demanding. At least I haven't noticed that. Uh, all you're going to do is you're going to cast upstream at about a 45-degree angle. You're going to let the fly drift through the run and then let it swing out below you. You make that classic quartering upstream cast. There's a big belly in the line, and you let it swing down below you. That swing will make the fly shoot up through the water. And that's the same motion that an emerging insect is going to make, which, again, is why soft hackles are so good at, at imitating those kinds of bugs. You can also fish soft hackles in a dead drift beneath an indicator. If you're fishing it beneath an indicator, you'll probably want to add a little bit of a swing at the end of your drift before you recast. This will help the soft tackle imitate an emerging insect more effectively. What I mean by that, if, if you're just going through your traditional drift and it's under an indicator, and let's say you've got a prince nymph up top and then you have a soft tackle on the bottom. When you get to the end of that drift, usually you just pick right up, roll cast, and put the, the indicator and flies down upstream again to go through the run one more time. What you want to do instead is, instead of just picking directly straight up out of the water, let the line go tight a little bit and lift, and that'll cause a little bit of a swing at the end of your drift, which pops that bottom fly, that soft tackle up, and that movement up. Again, it's like the food is getting away from the trout, and that's the same movement that an emerger makes. They start that that upswing. They're trying to get up out of the water and emerge. So that little movement can trigger a strike. I've actually caught quite a few nice fish doing that, And if you've caught fish at the end of a drift like that uh, underneath an indicator, that might be why your your nymphs might have made that movement that just triggered that strike immediately. So soft tackles also work really well. This is more of of, of a when to fish them type thing here. They also work really well if the fish are making smaller, splashy rises up on top or if you're in the beginning stages of a hatch. You really can fish them almost year-round with the exception of winter. So like I talked about at the beginning of this question, if soft tackles work so well, why aren't they fished more often? Well, I do know quite a few folks who add a bit of soft tackle to their nymphs. Uh, The guide's choice hairs ear is a good example of that fly. But I really just don't think it's caught on very much, at least in my neck of the woods, because it requires a different type of presentation than the traditional dry dropper or nymph rigs that we're also used to fishing because that's what we're taught. They're fairly simple and they're very productive. They're very productive ways to catch fish. It can feel like a soft tackle is only targeting specific fish in specific situations, which really is the truth. And that's why I'd say you should try it because when you have more tools in your toolbox, you're going to be a better angler. You're going to be able to catch those fish that are being picky, that they're refusing every dry fly. They're refusing every emerger. Maybe they need that soft tackle. Maybe they need that little action there at the end to entice them into eating. You know, I, I don't know. Maybe that's what will do it. Uh, anyways, I think that covers our soft tackle discussion. If If that wasn't clear, if you guys have more questions about soft tackles, please do not hesitate to get in touch. Hopefully I can clear that up. But it was great to to just chat about those flies for a little bit. Really appreciate that. Thank you. Next question comes to us. Ron from Florida writes in and says, Hey, Spencer, big fan of the podcast and appreciate all that you do. My question is travel related. What gear can I put in my carry-on bag and what gear must be packed in the suitcase? I've already flown several times with my fly rod and assorted items, mainly line, tippet, indicators, and other non-sharp items in my carry-on just to be safe. Where I get mixed messages when it comes to my fly is when it comes to my fly boxes. I put those items in my suitcases because I can't bear the thought of a TSA agent confiscating them. My largest flies are size 10 and run all the way to number 24s. It's gotten so bad that I now resort to splitting up the fly boxes and other items amongst the various suitcases just in case of lost luggage. Any clarity you could offer would be greatly appreciated. 
Thanks again, Diet Coke all the way and tight lines. Ron, you're a man after my own heart. You travel to fish and you drink Diet Coke. You sound like a real smart individual. Uh, you know, I just went through this on my recent Alaska trip, and I, I teased this in the hook of the episode today. Uh, hopefully I can help out. Uh, pro tip, don't argue with the TSA when they're going through your stuff because it's not going to end well for you, as I, I mentioned. You don't want to be barefoot in the terminal holding your pants up with your hand because you didn't get your belt back yet, yelling at somebody, give me back my rod. That, that's not a good sight. All right? That's just not a situation you want to be in. So I have flown with my fly fishing gear on Delta, Alaska, Southwest, and American, and all of them have let me carry on my fly rods. So I haven't had an issue with that. I actually have a big rod tube that can hold like 10 fly rods. It's amazing. And it fits in the overhead bins just fine. Uh, again, I did have that TSA agent uh, give me grief because uh, he said they looked suspicious. And he took them out. And he was he was inspecting these rods one by one. And it was an Alaska trip. So I was kind of perturbed because you know, I'm going to Alaska. I need my fly rods. Anyways, I was kind of snotty to him. And he was kind of snotty to me. But he shouldn't have been messing with my stuff. That's the way I see it. <laughs> Anyways. Other than that moment, I haven't had any problems flying with my gear. I always just put my reels and my flies into my checked luggage along with my waders and my boots and all my other gear. I don't want to jinx myself, and I hope I'm not, but I haven't had any issues doing that. I figure reels and flies are really easy to either replace or borrow when I get to my fishing destination. I never fly with any of my collectible reels. I've got got some vintage reels and vintage fly rods. I never fly with them because it's just not worth it. Uh, so I I reckon I can always, I can rent a reel or I can buy a cheap reel when I get to where I'm going. It's not the end of the world. Same with flies. Uh, what I don't want to have happen is that my rods get damaged, which is why I carry them on with me. Now, it is my understanding that you can't have flies in your carry-on luggage. Like I said, I haven't had issues with losing those before. And again, I hope that I'm not jinxing myself here, but I think you're probably safe to just keep them in your checked bags. I think splitting them up among all the bags might be a little overkill, uh, but you know, to, to each their own. So I could be wrong too about this, about keeping flies in the carry on. But like you said, I wouldn't want to risk my flies being permanently lost because some TSA agent is unhappy that morning. Uh, I mean, pro tip, but probably don't work for the TSA and you won't be unhappy, right? Little little slice of life wisdom there for you from, from uh, Untangled. So anyways, if anybody has flown with flies in their carry-on or know that it's legit, definitely let us know somehow. Leave us a comment, send an email, whatever. I'd love to hear from folks uh, who do that. But my big thing, my, my big tips with flying with your fly fishing gear, pretty simple, just Go light. You don't need anywhere near as much stuff as you think you do. And try and get it all in one bag. The recent Alaska trip I just did about a month ago, I got waders, boots, rain gear, reels, line, flies, all that stuff in one bag with uh, some other outdoors gear and all all the clothes and whatnot. So it's possible. Just just scrunch it all down and then keep your rods with you. I can't stress that enough. Keep your fly rods with you because it it would just really suck to have those things lost or broken. So uh, I've never had anybody give me grief with putting my fly rods up in the overhead bin. uh, And like I said, I've got a big case that I take them in. When I say big, it's just long enough for a four-piece rod. So it's not too bad. But you can fit like 10 of them in there. It's wonderful. So. Anyways, that's what I recommend. And if anybody's got other wonderful tips about flying with their gear, let us know. All right, thanks a bunch. Last question of the show. I can't believe we're already down to the end of it. Ed from Oregon writes in, says, Spencer, I enjoy your podcast. I'm not a beginner and I'm not an expert, so I learn a thing or two each week. But listening to this week's podcast several times, you talked about fluorocarbon and monofilament or mono tippet. I'm sorry, but this drives me nuts. All tippets are monofilament. They're either fluorocarbon or nylon. 
Monofilament, mean, monofilament means it is a single strand of man-made material. Since you are doing such a great job on teaching fly fishing, it would be great to impart these types of details to your audience. Okay, my gripe is over. Now my question. Tippet rings are a mainstay in a Euro rig. I'm using them now on my indicator or dry rigs. When fishing rocky or wooden woody streams that offer up lots of snags, it sure makes it easier to re-rig or at least prolongs leader life. I suppose it could be a hinge, but what negatives are there in doing this? Thanks. <laughs> well, Ed, you got me. I'm not being specific with my language. And you are 100% right. All tippet slash leader is quote-unquote monofilament in the sense that it is a single piece of material. Saying mono versus fluoro is a quick but inexact way to differentiate between nylon lines and fluorocarbon fly lines, or fluorocarbon lines, not fly lines, pardon me, I, I misspoke there. Nylon is just the material that tippet slash leader is made from. Fluorocarbon is a different material entirely, but some of the fluorocarbon products you see are just fluorocarbon coated nylon. So it gets really confusing, and it's it's been kind of in vogue, I guess, to say mono versus fluoro. So that's why I've always said it. Uh, but I appreciate the clarification, Ed, and I should probably try to be a lot more specific in the future. Now, as to your question, a tippet ring, for those who do not know, is almost exactly what it sounds like. It's a very small metal ring. And I actually, I thought I had some, but I, I can't find them. I was going to show them to everybody, but they're a very tiny metal ring that you can tie a tippet to. It is often used in Euro rigs, as Ed mentioned, so that you can tie one long tag end and one short tag end off the tippet ring. It can be a lot stronger than creating those tags with a surgeon's knot. So if you want to try and visualize it, let's say you're, you're rigging up a, a nymph rig and you have your leader coming down and you tie it off to this tippet ring. Instead of tying a nymph on and then tying a, a dropper off of that nymph, so you've got two nymphs, uh, instead of tying that off of the bend of the hook, you would just take one long piece, like maybe three feet long, and tie that onto the tippet ring, put your nymph on the bottom of there, and then do one that's 18 inches, tie that off the tippet ring and put another nymph there. They drift independently of each other, uh, and as Ed said, there are advantages to doing this because it can help sometimes with snags and whatnot. It's also a lot quicker to re-rig than the traditional tandem nymph rig, which is when you tie them, you tie one and then tie another off the bend of that hook. They're being fished in tandem. So uh, it is easier, like Ed said, to re-rig with your tippet rings. Uh and as to your, uh, as to the other part of your question there, Ed, there really isn't a downside to using tippet rings to create your nymph rigs. Any hinge that they create is going to be pretty minimal, and I don't really think it impacts the drift or your ability to detect strikes. A hinge, for those don't, who don't know, is exactly what it sounds like. It's a little bit of a bend in your rig that makes your flies drift at a slightly different angle. So, yeah, if you're using tippet, tippet rings and they're working for you, well, keep using them, man. Go for it. Um, awesome. Well, that is it for the questions for this week's show, which means coming up next, it is story time with Spencer. This week's story time, I want to tell you all about, this was a couple weeks ago, and school was back in session. So I'm out, I'm out there teaching, and we had Friday afternoon. They, they let us go early, so we, we get a, one Friday a month off. And I hopped in my truck, and I just shot up the canyon. I, I didn't know where I was going to fish yet. I was just cruising around, hoping to find somewhere. And I, I drove past the first stream in the canyon, and it, was, it wasn't bad. It was looking good. But I'd, I'd fished it a lot lately, so I wanted, to, I wanted to do something different. I wanted a different experience. So I cruised up on top of the mountain. There's this little spring creek. Nobody knows about it. It's like the most low-key little creek ever. I have it to myself all of the time. It's never crowded at all. And I'm being very sarcastic <laughs> for, those who, for those who can't tell. 
it's usually pretty crowded. And it was a Friday afternoon. So I thought, man, do I really want to go up there and fight those crowds? Well, I, I did. And surprisingly enough, I got up there and I found a turnout that didn't have anybody parked there. So I knew I had probably the whole quarter mile river that I could fish that hadn't hopefully been tromped through uh, recently. So I I get in there and I start walking down from the truck and it was just a perfect bluebird day. Just as wonderful weather. The caddis are starting to hatch a little bit. There's some PMDs coming off and I come around this corner and I see this big, beautiful pool on this big bend and I see a fish rise. And I just think, man, I made the best decision of my whole life coming up here. And it really probably was to be completely honest with you. Well, anyways, I cruise downstream of that pool so I can get in and and work my way up to the pool. And I got in below another pool. So there's two pools. I got in below another pool and there were fish rising in this other pool. So I, I go up through and I fish that and I catch one out of there. It was one of the nicest cutthroat I've ever caught from this stream. It, the stream is mostly cutthroat and they're they're pretty big. Uh, you know, like a, I don't know, they probably average 13, 14 inches. And I caught both of the fish I caught on this particular day were like 18 inches long. It was kind of nuts. And uh, I'm working my way up through, I'm fishing and I get back to the pool where I saw the fish rise at the beginning. So this is where I'm super excited because this was, this is the big stuff, right? This is the, these fish look big and I could tell because they were still rising that they were bigger trout. So I did not want to screw this up. So I sit there and I watch them for just a minute. And I'm just looking at them like, all right, how are you guys eating? And it looks like they're eating emergers. So I tie on an emerger behind my caddis dry fly thinking, all right, I got them dead rights. They're mine. No, that's not what happened at all. They ignored it. Mostly because my drifts were awful because I was standing in the wrong spot and I had to start moving myself to get a good drift that didn't have any drag. And that's something that is really tough. I think to figure out for new anglers, you get to the pool or you get to a run or whatever, and you're trying to trying to get a a drift without any drag. And you really do need to move yourself in those situations because you moving yourself is going to be a more effective way to present that fly without drag than trying to make a longer cast or to stack more mins in there. That That's just going to exacerbate the problem. You want to just move yourself. So I finally moved myself enough to where there wasn't any drag on my flies, and I'm finally getting a good drift, and the fish are ignoring it. They're still eating, so I know that they're not bothered by me standing where I am because if they were, they would have quit feeding. But they're still eating, and I start doing that classic, you know, go through my box and trying every single fly, trying to figure out what fly they're actually eating. And they refused every single bug in my box. I was starting to take it personal, starting to doubt all my skills as an angler, wondering why I even came up there. What good is this fly rod of mine? I should just chuck all this gear in the bushes and leave it. Right? I'm more frustrated by this than anything else. Uh, sometimes it really does feel that way, right? So and finally, I said, you know what? They're not eating the, the any of my murders. I'm just going to put a zebra midge back on because a zebra midge is my go-to fly. I caught more fish on a zebra midge than any other fly I have. So I throw that up in there and... Uh, the water on this little stream is crystal clear, so I can see the fish. They're just hanging out. And I watch my fly drift down, and I can see the dry fly, and I see where I think my nymph is, where that zebra midge is, and I just see the trout open its mouth. I see the, the white flash of, of the cutthroat's mouth, and then it closes, and I'm like, well, that was right there. So I just set the hook. My dry fly didn't move at all. I set the hook based on sight alone. And that's the other thing I wanted to point out. When you're in a situation where you can watch the fish, if the water is that clear, watch the fish. Because more times than not, 
you will be able to see them eat your fly before there's any indication on, especially if you're doing a nymph rig like that or a, a dry dropper rig, you can be able to see that way sooner than if you're just staring at your dry fly. And if I had just been staring at my dry fly, I would have missed it because the fish did not move the dry fly when it ate my nymph. I don't know how they do that, but they do it. And it's really frustrating (laughs) when they're able to like suck your nymph in and spit it out and your dry fly doesn't move at all. If you're fishing a dry dropper rig, same goes for an indicator rig though. They'll do that where they just suck it in, spit it out. Nothing moves. There's no way to tell unless you have eyes on them. So it was really cool. I, I caught that fish and it was, yeah, like I said, it was about 18 inches. It was a great fish. And I I would not have caught it if I hadn't been watching it. So those are the two lessons I hope you take from this story. Uh, the Well, there's three. The other one is go fishing when you have the chance because the best time to fish is when you can. I believe John Girak said that. So it's one of the many things that uh, good old John's written that I agree with wholeheartedly. So, uh, well, that wraps up the show, folks. I really appreciate everybody who sticks around for story time who enjoys the show. Thank you for the ratings and reviews uh, that you leave. Please subscribe to the show if you haven't already. And if you haven't left us a rating or a review, please do so. It helps out a ton. And as always, if you have any questions at all that you would like answered, leave or or click the, uh, the link in the podcast description. It'll take you to place. You can submit those questions and I'll get around to answering them just as soon as I possibly can. And... I think that wraps it up for us today, folks. So get out there, get some fishing done, and until next week, tie lines, everybody.